Welcome to this course teaching the tenets of tithing to others. This is Dennis Fry. I'll be your professor for these lectures. This is a concise history of the biblical concept of Christian stewardship beginning in the Old Testament and we will end in the New Testament. The purpose of this course is to assist you as a Bible teacher or Bible preacher in presenting to others, parishioners, members of a Sunday school class, uh, potential members of a church, those who are your students in classes who want to know what is a concise overview of the principles or the concepts, the history of biblical stewardship, the questions about tithing. Now, here is a disclaimer at the very beginning. There are as many opinions uh, as uh, one might imagine on the subject of biblical tithing. Uh, when a person comes to Christ in the average church, one of the first things they have to deal with is the matter of what do I give to the local church? How much should I give? How do I start tithing? What is tithing? These questions are filled with, uh, well, with what we might call ecclesiastical landmines. And this is because across denominational and local independent church, uh, the, la the landscape of all of that wide variety of who and what we are as Christians, Christian denominations, independent churches, are the various concepts of tithing, of giving. And so the purpose of this course here is not to fit into any particular theological paradigm, but to give a concise study, an overview of the biblical history, the biblical teaching then of Christian stewardship. And I say biblical history because, you know, <clears throat> the scripture is a book of history. And we go back to the very beginning uh, in the book of Genesis where we start our look at, our overview, our study of, these biblical tenets, and we move all the way up through to the New Testament. So let's begin our study. What are the differences between biblical tithing, offerings, and stewardship overall? What are the differences and how are these connected? We're going to begin in Lecture 1 with biblical tithing. So let's look at the history of biblical tithing, the early biblical and secular history of tithing. The word tithe, of course, comes from the word that means a tenth, uh, osar or masar in Hebrew, and the word simply means a tenth. Now, it is not just biblical history, but secular history, where we find the practice of tithing. Tithing is not limited to Christianity. The idea of giving a tenth goes way, way back in world history. Now, I believe personally that it goes back very far, very early into world history because it is a principle taught by God, the God of Adam, down through the God of Noah, and down through the God of Abraham. Now, of course, Abraham comes out of Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham is essentially a pagan when God calls him. But the teachings that he learns from the customs handed down, beginning with the repopulation of the world under Noah, I believe go all the way back to the very beginning. But the idea of giving a, a custom tribute or a tenth of the spoils of war was a very ancient practice. Let's find its first evidence in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Now you are going to need your Bible throughout this study. I will be using my paper Bible. You may you want to use your electronic Bible, but we're going to be turning to these verses, so you need to get your Bible. And I'll give you just a moment to do that. All right, we have our Bible. We're turning now to Genesis chapter 14. And let's drop down to verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, 
that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. He gave him a tenth of all. Now let's move to Genesis in Genesis to chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And in Genesis chapter 28, we find that Jacob has promised a tenth of all God gave to him. So Jacob's going to give back to God a tenth of all that God gave him. So in Genesis chapter 28, we drop down to verse 18. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Lutz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on the journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now there's no indication here that this idea of giving a tenth is anything new. In fact, there is a sense here in which you could you could almost feel that Jacob is saying, I will do what I know I'm supposed to do, and that is give a tithe of all that you give me back to you. Now, this is, of course, Jacob. This is before there's a tabernacle. This is before there is a holy of holies. This is before the Levitical priesthood is set up. But the practice of tithing goes very, very far back into history and biblical history. Then, of course, <clears throat> we find that it is embedded in Levitical history itself. Mosaic law codified a giving of a tenth of the produce of fields, of fruit trees, of flocks and herds, and whatever other source of produce a person might acquire through their work, through their profession, through their livelihood of fruits, of seeds, and grain, of those things were, which could be consumed, which would be eaten, or ordinary everyday food. A person could, instead of giving a tenth of the actual item, they could give its value in money, providing they added 20% to it. Now there's a lesson here. And the lesson is that the idea of tithing is to give back what God has given. So if you're going to give back what man has developed, a form of currency, to estimate the value of an item, then you add 20% to it. The interesting thing is, though, that while you could substitute the produce of the fields you could substitute fruits, seeds, and grain, wheat, or barley, or pomegranates, or figs, or dates. or You, you could substitute money for that, plus 20%. You could not substitute animals with money. Very interesting. Well, let's turn to Leviticus then and find chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27. And, of course, this is early on in the history of Israel. These are the first teachings that God is giving through Moses uh, to the priesthood. And so in drop down in Genesis chapter 27 to verses 30 and 32, 30 through 32. So in Genesis 27, 30, we read, Thus all the tithe of the land of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, 
is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And why is it the Lord's? Well, first of all, God created all of those things, and he created man. If, therefore, a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth, 20%. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. In other words, you're counting them off under the rod. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a ten. Okay, take that one out. That one belongs to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it, or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. In other words, hey, when you're counting these off, you know, oh, here comes a really good one. Let, let's, let's make him number 11 rather than number 10. You're supposed to, not supposed to do that. Uh, all right, we understand. Uh, very often, if um, you can uh, relate to this, very often things given to the church are, well, that's good enough to give to the church or good enough to give to missions. No, not good enough to give to God. No, uh, you just take it as it comes. Interesting. Now, notice the emphasis on produce. Why is this? Well, because particularly early on, uh, Israel was an agrarian society. Uh, it was a it was a, a farming community, and as a nation, and as that nation, and most nations, this is true of as well. Uh, as the nation of Israel was being formed during those forty years of wandering. And really for many generations after, it will remain an agrarian society. And such an intimate relationship with the land added value to the tithe. Think of the person, if you have farmed or if you garden or if you grew up on a farm or if you still live on a farm or in a farming community, you know how much sweat and hard work, backbreaking work goes into real farming. And this intimate relationship that one has with the land gives a different sense of ownership to things grown, to things tended, to things watched over, to things watered, and things looked after until they come to fruition, as opposed to when we just pick up a paycheck or see it deposited in our account. And so the giving of a tithe had a very, a very personal meaning. Now, uh, is there a tithe, or is there a tithe, or is there a tithe? In other words, are there one, two, or three kinds of tithes? Well, there's a lot of debate and even ambiguity uh, as to whether there are one, two, three kinds of tithes, or whether there's only one kind of tithe, and yet... Uh, in three different venues. So, let's turn to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. And in Exodus chapter 23, let's drop down to verse 16. And then we're going to go over to chapter uh, 19. So, Exodus chapter 23. And I'm turning in my Bible as you turn in yours. So, we look down at verse 16. Also, you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Also, the feast of the end gathering at the end of the year, when you gather in the fruit, the fruit from your labors of the field. Wow, see again that, that deep connection to what I'm going to give, I've worked so hard for all year long. I see it, I touch it, I feel it, I prune it. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Now we have, uh, we have this whole idea then of something's going to be done, and you're going to sacrifice, and you're going to you're going to give a portion. And verse 19, you shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. Now to bring the first fruits in. Now let's go from verse 19 over to. Chapter 34, 
chapter 34 and verse 26. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. So some rabbis taught that there is only one tithe. Others taught two. And now we'd, in a little while we'll see that there may have been three. And yet, as I mentioned just a moment ago, some taught there's only one, but the three are a continuation of the one. Well, let's look at the tithe one, two, and three. Tithe number one was from the first fruits of the yearly produce as it came in through harvesting. Let's move to Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27 and drop down to verse 30. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Ah, so if therefore a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes onto the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. That's tithe number one, the first fruits. Tithe number two, now this tithe was for landowners only. After the first fruit tithe was given, a tenth of the remaining nine tenths was to be set aside. So the first tithe was a tenth of the first fruits of the yearly harvest as it came in from the harvesting. And the second tithe was for the landowner, not the workers in the fields, but the landowner, so that after the first fruit tithe was given, whatever's left over of the remaining nine tenths, a tenth of that was to be set aside. Now there is a third tithe, and that was a special tithe taken from the second tithe. Now you can see why some taught there's only one tithe, but the next two were continuations of the first tithe. So tithe number three uh, was a special tithe taken from this, that second tithe that was set aside, uh, and it was given every third year and set aside for the community, for communal distribution. So let's go to uh, the end of the Pentateuch, to the book of Deuteronomy, and let's try and find chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14. And Deuteronomy chapter 14, let's drop down to verse 28, verse 28. And we'll read verse 29. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and shall deposit it in your town. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town, shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So, it can be very complicated, and this is why many disputes arose over, and we have disputes today, over tithing. So the question is, well, who, who got what and why of the tithes, of those three tithes? Now, whether we see them as one tithe with a one, two, three step, or we see them as three distinct tithes, there are three distributions. The first tithe was for the support of the priests, the Levites, the worship workers the, that, that kept the tabernacle, and then, of course, later the temple. And then much later, that same principle applied to synagogues. Uh, now, today, 
we see it applied not only to synagogues, but also to the workers in a Christian church, in a local church. All right, let's go back to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18, and let's drop down to verses 20, and we'll read a number of verses here. Chapter 18, verse beginning with verse 20. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. I am your portion, and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. To the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service, which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting. Ah, sound familiar to Christian pastors? to staff members. The sons of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting again, or they shall bear sin and die. Only the Levites shall perform the service at the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the sons of Israel, so they shall have no inheritance for the tithe of the sons of Israel which they offer as an offering to the Lord. I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said concerning them, they shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. So that tithe then is given for the support of the priesthood. Verse 25, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. Ah, a tithe of the tithe. So, pastors uh, tithe, don't they? They tithe on the tithe. Verse 27, your offering shall be reckoned to you as the grain from the threshing floor or the full produce from the wine vat. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you sh shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priests. Out of all your gifts you shall present every offering due to the Lord from all of the best of them, the sacred parts from them. You shall say to them, When you have offered from it the best of it, then the rest shall be reckoned to the Lord as the product of the threshing floor and as the product of the wine vat. You may eat it anywhere, and you, you and your household, for it is your compensation and return for your service in the tent of meeting. You shall bear no sin by reason of it when you have offered the best part of it, but you shall not profane it, the sacred gifts of the sons of Israel, or you will die. Aha! So, we have this brought fast forward to Christian ministers who receive their income from the work that they perform in the family of God, from the family. And then also they tithe on their portion and are to consider their income a sacred gift from God. Now, the second tithe was to be used by the family for an annual holy celebration at the sanctuary. Now, this gets a little complicated uh, because that sounds almost as if that comes out of the blue. Actually, it doesn't. And so let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy and to chapter 14 and drop down to verse 22 for the expl explanation. So Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22. Two, you shall surely tithe all of the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. By the way, that is, of course, now where? Jerusalem. Tithe, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd or your flock, so that you may Learn to fear the Lord your God. If the distance is too great for you that you are not able to bring the tithe 
since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice you in your household. Also you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. And then, of course, it goes on to speak about every third year you should bring out all of the tithe of your produce in that year, and it shall be deposited in your town. So the third tithe, that third tithe, which we move on to now, that third tithe was for the care of the Levites, orphans, wid widows, the destitute, the foreigners who were in need. Verse 29, the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, and the widow, who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So who got what and why? The first tithe, the support of the priests in the tabernacle, in the temple, and in synagogues. And the second was to be used by the family in a holy celebration as they come to the sanctuary. And the third tithe for the communal care of those who were in need. Now, the question is, was the tithe gross or net? Oh, this is a difficult subject for many, so I don't want to avoid landmines, but I don't want to unnecessarily explode them either. <laughs> so whatever your position on that is, hold your position between you and the Lord, but here is here is a explanation. Was the tithe gross or net? The explanation is there is simply no way to reconcile this question biblically. And this is why so much disagreement exists among the ancient rabbis. Some taught that too great a tithe burden on the poor would only serve to impoverish and discourage all agreed that a tenth of the increase was required. And this could be interpreted as tithing on the produce or portion that was left after legitimate expense and obligations. So should I tithe on my net after taxes or should I tithe on my gross before taxes? Ah, now, there's simply no way to fully reconcile that question biblically. However, we will later come back to that idea. So let's hold it for just now, because we're dealing with the history of biblical tithing. Now, what was the whole tithe? Ah, let's turn to that most neglected of books, in the Old Testament, with the exception of its emphasis on tithing. The book of Malachi doesn't get so much attention except in chapter 3. So chapter 3, verse 10, so well known, I'm sure. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. What was the whole tithe? The whole tithe was the first tithe. Or, if you think there were three separate, then it was the second and the third tithe. The whole tithe was either, okay, this is one tithe, and we have the second and third continuation of it, or there are three tithes. However you look at it, that's the whole tithe. Now, what was that storehouse? All right, let's take a little left-hand turn and go way back 
to the book of Nehemiah. Let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38, Nehemiah 10, verse 38, the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. What was the storehouse? Well, there's a, a concept called storehouse tithing. The temple for the supply of the priests, the Levites, the workers, those who kept the temple up, and charitable works were to be administered by the priests and Levites, and hence they were to be the keepers of the tithe, and they were to be brought into, in this case here, the temple, later into the synagogues. And, in fact, many uh, teach that, uh, just a side thought here, many teach that the synagogue system was already in place way, way early in Israel's history. And, of course, we in the Christian tradition follow the synagogue concept. And that is that in communities we have local churches. And so the local church becomes the storehouse where the tithe is brought. And, of course, we see there the tremendous responsibility that's placed upon those to do this. Now, what are the extremes? <laughs> okay, the extremes on the teaching of tithing. The most common extreme is neglect. And we have just read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Let's go back to Malachi, and let's take another look at that verse. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. So there, dropping down to verse 10, we read, Ah, oh, verse what? Bring, okay, if I will not open you, hmm, why? Verse 9, verse 8, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? Answer in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. It's neglect. The most common extreme in tithing is neglect. Not doing it at all. Or only doing uh, it uh, sporadically, inconsistently. But there is another extreme, and that is exploitation. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew and get pretty close to the end. And we're down to chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23. And verses 1 through 4, Matthew 23, 1 through 4. Now these, this is Jesus. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. The exploitation of tithes and offerings, does that need an explanation? Particularly in the case of the corrupted priesthood of Jesus' day. Not all the priests were corrupt, not all the Levites were corrupt, not all the Pharisees were corrupt. Remember, it was two Pharisees, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who tenderly cared for the body of our Lord after his crucifixion. But the corrupt leaders of the day, and unfortunately we must say from history that most were corrupt, not all, but most, exploited the people. They pressed down heavy burdens upon people. They used the people for their own gain. They expected you to tithe 
but they didn't. They expected you to tithe so they could use what you tithe for wrong purposes. But they also pressed it to excessiveness, excessiveness. So let's go to Luke chapter 11 and find verse 42. Luke 11 and verse 42. In verse 42 we read, But woe to you Pharisees, these are the words of Jesus again, But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God, for these are the things you should have done without neglecting the other. Excessiveness. There was a element of Phariseeism that taught that if you have a sprig of a mint or a rue, you have this little mint plant, and it puts out a shoot, and it has leaves. You start counting it leaf number one, two, three, four, and as soon as leaf number ten sprouts, you have to pick it off and give that as a tithe. Now it continues to grow. Oh, here's two, three, four, five more. Here's the 20th leaf. Pluck that off. Give it. Just excessiveness, creating burdens. And as Jesus later said, you know, you put burdens, earlier said, you put burdens on them that you yourselves are not able uh, to bear. So there are the extremes of tithing. There's neglect, which is the primary and most common extreme. Then there's exploitation of the tithe people give. And then there's the excessiveness, the burdensomeness that can be, can be taught. Well, we've taken a look at the history of biblical tithing. Now we're going to move on in the next lecture to the next step. So this will be the end of lecture number one, and I look forward to joining you for lecture number two.